impartiality, art, performance, and religion. While preparing a new research project on the Palawan archipelago, I continue to write up the findings from earlier field work concerning art, performance, and martial arts in Malaysia, Singapore, and Guam. Indigenous religion, in tandem with martial arts, are reported as all but extinct in Micronesia, an assumption that I have previously challenged. Nevertheless, respecting ethnographic discretion in the maintenance of secret traditions and in recognition of pioneering French research, I consider a study in martiality as an alternative to martial arts. Inspired by last year's martial arts studies conclave, followed by a year on Palau, I offer some tentative remarks and initial typologies of martiality. My aim is to help reconfigure the horizons of possibility for research into martial arts, religion, and spirituality, indicate the dangers of toxic martiality, and consider a study of martiality in the Palawan archipelago. Last year, I was invited to the martial arts studies pre-conference meeting at the University Ex Marseille to set up the Martial Arts, Religion and Spirituality 2020 conference, which due to the COVID-19 pandemic was moved online. A dozen French university faculty had a fascinating set of exchanges with Dr. Jean-Marc de Grave, Professor Paul Bauman and myself, forming a conclave from which to articulate new and innovative ways to help frame and shape the future direction of martial arts research. To cut straight to the point, the assembled faculty argued that martial arts is an anachronism that makes no sense in French. Instead, the term martiality was preferred. The term martial arts studies arose in my 2011 co-edited book entitled Martial Arts as Embodied Knowledge. I was never entirely comfortable with the notion, although it did seem an advance over hopnology and other how-to approaches obsessed with techniques, rankings, evolutions, origins and authenticity. In my 2015 inaugural martial arts studies keynote, I suggested that it was my co-author, Dr. John Whalenbridge, a professor of English literature, who came up with the category. Recently he disavowed this and said it was something we figured out together back when I was a postgraduate student. In any case, Professor Paul Bauman contributed a chapter on Bruce Lee to the Martial Arts as Embodied Knowledge volume, and then, seizing the initiative, he created a conference, a journal, a social media platform, and a book series. Martial Arts Studies had therefore emerged as a discipline in its own right, taking its place in the hallowed ground of university courses alongside cultural studies, performance studies, religious studies, and now appears well grounded with the publication of the Martial Arts Studies Reader. Nevertheless, a schism is evidenced in the Martial Arts Studies Reader between those contributing authors who advocate for the primacy of discourse, media, and representation versus those who prioritize institutions, practice, and embodiment, albeit with various mixtures across the split and performance rendered either way depending on the author. The schism between realism and phenomenology, um, empiricism and rationalism, materialism and idealism is as old as the hills and is inherited from Aristotle's politics versus Plato's Republic. The split plays out in mind-body dualism which I've earlier rejected in favour of a Deleuzean nomadological approach to interrogate visceral and somatic dimensions phenomenology and psychoanalysis, subjectivity and colonialism. I shall not repeat those arguments here. Suffice it to say, this paper arises from the same theoretical bedrock. Instead, here I wish to make an intervention into martial arts studies to consider a change in the way in which the subject, object, martial arts may be perceived and understood by an alternative focus on martialities. To commence with brass tacks, in my experience, the mere whiff of triviality, violence, and working class subaltern difference permeating research in martial arts, whether framed as 
martial arts studies, fighting scholars, or cultures of combat meets with summary dismissal from university employment committees. Such committees wield a poisoned pen shrouded in the polite parlance of rejects due to overly specialised research concentration. The same may be said for grant applications, excluding UNESCO's cultural heritage preservation of traditional martial arts, part of the global museification of culture. It is an open question whether rebranding as martialities may help to shake off the stigma of martial arts as a trivial discourse struggling to emerge. There is more at stake in positioning towards martiality than pragmatic rebranding, however, as demonstrated below. Behind the scenes of the organisation for the 2020 Martial Arts, Religion and Spirituality Conference, a title I suggested, faculty at the University of Aix Marseille and elsewhere wanted to rename the event Martiality, Religion and Spirituality. To paraphrase Dr. Bauman, this turn was resisted in part as martial arts studies has already become a brand in its own right because martial arts are a discursive reality and due to the conference already being announced towards funding. Some may say, who cares, it's the same thing. However, whether the focus should turn from martial arts to martiality is not simply a matter of French and British scholars quibbling over concepts, categories and terminology in a pedantic hair-splitting contest. I think the debate arouses anthropological interest because it reveals a clash, a difference of perspective, even an alternative Weltanschauung. Above, I have outlined how the tide flowed from martial arts as embodied knowledge to martial arts studies. Yet it should be remembered that Dr. Jean-Marc de Grave and Dr. Stéphane Renaussance also contributed chapters to the martial arts as embodied vo knowledge volume, both of them following on from earlier French research in martiality. Professor Megan Morris, in a recent article on institutional kung fu in academic self-care, recommends scholars to make a substantial change of focus every six years. At nine years old theoretically, and five organisationally, perhaps it is time for martial arts studies to take a fresh direction towards martialities. By the same token, no doubt scholars of martiality, said to be at least 40 years of age, although conceivably much older, will find research in martial arts studies refreshing. In my view, a shift, from, a shift in focus towards martialities from martial arts studies is valid and useful for reasons that are conceptual, perceptual, methodological and institutional. In the following, I make a case for an ideational shift towards martiality, providing examples from academic reflection, personal experience and current ethnographic research design on the Palauan archipelago. Eschewing premature definition, I offer a evocative gloss of martiality, then address the notion in relation to gender and masculinity to introduce the term toxic martiality. Martiality is subsequently counterpoised to religion and sorcery to bridge the gap, to bridge the uh, war magic and martial arts, and move the discussion into the terrain of yogic warrior poses, animacy, and prehistoric rock art. I conclude with a brief section on Palau to consider bodily resonance across dance, underwater spearfishing, and community house by building. Martialites. It has been suggested that the key missing ingredient in today's martial arts training is realism, the acquisition of actual combat experience. Given Green's excellent account of the 52s, also known as the 52 hand blocks, we can be assured that ample realism may be acquired in prison and elsewhere besides, for example, in the violent schools and streets of Plymouth, my hometown, Marseille or Minneapolis. To kick off with an evocative gloss, a good example to envisage martiality is provided by reading Homer's Iliad. Here, boxing and wrestling, by which I read martial arts, are rendered as sports in contrast to ferocious battleground skirmishes fought mostly on, with spears, on foot, on horseback, and from chariots. Now please close your ears momentarily if you're susceptible to triggers. 
Can we even imagine the sheer horror, fear and elation the ancient battlefield bestowed? The Iliad brims over with accounts of the bloody carnage and horror and mass of smashed skulls, bashed in brains, broken teeth, popped eyeballs, severed torsos, hacked off limbs, castrated genitals and chopped off heads. Add to this the ground becoming slippery from the sudden shocking and massive eruption of blood, compounded with the stench of gore, feces, vomit, guts, urine and gall. Terrible screams, howls of triumph and deafening shrieks of pain, defeat and despair alternate with dying declarations, anguished whispers, crying or blood gurgling from a cut throat. In heroic cultures, the mass troops would engage in battle behind, around and together with their champions who led the charge. Battle afforded eyewitness exposure to great feats arising from better training, metallurgy and technology and from superior prowess, skill, strength, speed, cunning, deception or luck. Most important, the effective states aroused in battle included experiences of wild fury, panic, dread, shock and pride where fear and cowardice alternated with fortitude and self-sacrifice. Addressing martiality thus facilitates an analysis of the mind and body in conflict to consider violent suffering and warfare through training, practice or rehearsal and as represented or reproduced in archaeology, history, art, sculpture, film, music, dance and ritual. Martiality serves to highlight the fundamental question of what is a body capable or following spats of what can a body do. By linking the spheres of the actual to the virtual, mind to matter, the possible to the improbable, reality to fantasy, violence to religion. Considering the, consider the following quotation from Tim Ingock. The Yukip Eskimos, according to Anne Vienna Riordan, recognize a class of extraordinary persons who are so fleet of foot they can literally take off, leaving a trail of wind blown snow in the trees. The ability to take off and fly is familiar in Chinese cinema and European witchcraft alike. Ingold is making an argument in Being Alive against agency and for animacy. That is, there is no mystical spirit breathed into dead flesh or lifeless matter, but that the atmosphere, the world, indeed the universe itself, is in constant movement or becoming. I'm intrigued by this insight, having studied animist martial arts and also living here in Palau. Let us return to Ingold's quote, above for a moment, critically this time. It's, he said, she said, they said. Now I'm saying it, and then maybe you say it. And how many iterations did the story go through before it reached the ears, not the eyes, mind you, of the anthropologist? Ingold is dismissive of ethnography, but I argue that it facilitates writing from observation experience. In other words, from uh, Vakan and from Spencer, from being an observant participant. Now this used to be called uh, working from primary sources uh, before the postmodern term. Anyway, to my mind, the he said, she said, they said, this is where monsters dwell. Alas, I have personally not achieved self-propelled flight through the snow-covered trees. Yet I have been jettisoned six foot across a room at the explosive touch of a palm strike, thankfully with no ill effect. At four in the morning, when he had forgotten his keys, I saw the palm striker, my Hungar teacher, run three stories up a sheer vertical wall to enter a narrow horizontal window into his apartment. I was astonished that he achieved this in a flash, straight up and in, done in one smooth blow. Some vernacular martial arts, to, to use Thomas Green's expression, explore and harness remarkable hidden powers of the body, and some make claims of immortality, telepathy, invulnerability, and so forth. Aside from the fact that we are still working out of what is a body capable, however, it should be remembered 
that martial arts are also mnemonic devices. That is, they tell stories from the near and very remote past, often passed down in symbolic, performative, and mythological forms. To borrow terms from Bernard Stiegler's The Reenchantment of the World, such accounts are important because they promote association in a dissociated world. In other words, they enchant disenchantment. <clears throat> Martiality serves then as the elusive bridge between martial arts and war magic or dark shamanism, highlighting the production of actual and magical technology to cause harm or defense. I shall continue this further below. For now, I would like to mention that perhaps a study in martiality would be better equipped to directly inquire into the self-sacrifice of the samurai. As a, as a form of suicide, rather than to appendage suicide to the study of martial arts. <clears throat> Sabuku. After Durkheim, what must be questioned for a study in suicide is a culture in its entirety, incorporating the deceased individual and not just a particular facet, club, style or organisation. Martiality, broadly conceptualised, interrogates death, the burial of the dead, the remembrance of past victories and defeats, and the deification or demonization of enemy, enemy combatants and their gods. That is, martiality addresses deathscapes, memorialized or evidenced in art, performance, writing, oral culture, training halls, museums, and cemeteries around the world. Martiality, gender, and religion. In ancient Greece, Ares was the god of war, the maligned precursor of Mars, the Roman god of war. Mars is, of course, the etymological root of martial, martiality, the month of March, and the basis for the spear and shield symbol for masculinity. This symbol was adopted in biology after Linnaeus in 1750. Where, mas where masculinity is ideologically constructed and represented as martiality in a gender society. Martiality then is deeply rooted in discourses of classical religion and violence, where violence or stopping violence is supposedly equated with gender. The rise of women competitors in mixed martial arts tournaments Women serving in combat roles in the armed forces of Israel and elsewhere, however, should demonstrate that obviously there is no fixed gender to martiality. This finding is backed up historically in the anthropology of martial arts. For example, McCoy and Johnson's excellent chapter, The Women's Army of the Dahomey in uh, West Africa. Hello again. This is the view from just inside the bay. Toxic Martiality. To produce a full-blown typology of martiality is beyond the scope of this paper. To preempt the task, I would heed Aristotle's politics and start with empirical examples. To include, at the very least, criminal, piratical, war machine, military, police, revolutionary and monastic martialities. Turning from theory to ethnographic observation, on my way back from pistol, rifle and shotgun lessons in which to falls, I flew through Houston, Texas. The flight attendants invited United States military personnel in uniform to board the aircraft first. Then military personnel not in uniform, then first class passengers, then parents with children and then people with special needs. For a country supposedly not at war, the warrior class consciousness, warrior class conscious boarding sequence alongside the frequently heard statement Thank you for your service, denotes hypermartiality. More than 800 military bases are scattered across the globe in a forward projection of military power that has changed little since the Cold War. The fact is, the United States is at war, abroad and within its own communities, where permanent war is a substitute for revolution.
In a harsh capitalist milieu, toxic martiality refers to the projection of power and authority through military and state violence, that is, through the repressive apparatus of the state. As I have said before, contemporary mixed martial arts reflects a brutal American capitalism where a winner takes all and loser gets grounded and pounded. There is no better example of toxic martiality than that shown in the recent murder of George Floyd, the latest homicide, for how long? In a long list of minority deaths in US police custody demonstrating the misuse of chokeholds by an institutionally racist police force. The United States has more than 18,000 different police agencies with different regulations and standards. That police are training in multiple chokeholds of the blood and of the airways is something I saw for myself when training with Spike 22 MMA Gymnasium on Guam. During the course of an 18th month performance ethnography and participant observation, I met Royce Gracie for dinner together with Ray Tenorio, the former Lieutenant Governor. Gracie was invited to Guam to set up a police training program. Arming the police with chokeholds from Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, in my view, is part and parcel of the militarization of the police in the United States and internationally. We must stop and ask ourselves, if we wish to live in civil societies, governed by the will of the people, or police states, ruled under martial law, constant surveillance, and new technologies of control. However, it must be added that other non-toxic, indeed revolutionary martialities exist within and beyond the confines of the state. Notable is the resistance of Black Lives Matter in peaceful protest. And perhaps most of all is in the daily struggle of oppressed minorities colonised and dispossessed peoples to survive under a system rigged for the benefit of the 1%. Religion, sorcery and politics. In the Devil's Dictionary, Ambrose Bierce said that sorcery is another word for politics. Bruce Capferra his anthropology of Sinhalese sorcery established a tension between sorcery and politics, the war machine and the state, in the creation of alternate virtualities. Neil Whitehead also made an important contribution to the politics of sorcery with studies of the dark shaman in British Guyana. And he takes the idea of virtualities even further with a detailed edited volume on technologies and imaginaries of terror, killing and magical death. Another way to refer to dark shamanism is, is to refer to the phenomena of war magic. <coughs> Excuse me. In my introduction to war magic, an edited volume to which Neil Whitehead agreed to write a chapter but later declined to contribute, I trace the concepts of religion, magic, shamanism and sorcery <coughs> along vectors of sociality, which it could be individual or collective, private or public. Purpose, to harm or to heal. Method, to summon by spells or supplicate with prayer. Ethical ideal, benevolent or malevolent. And vector, to enter another realm or to summon power into this realm. Benevolent practices that benefit the community through healing, supplicating power, God, gods, from another realm may be referred to as religion. <clears throat> Conversely, malevolent practices that benefit the individual cause harm and which summon powers, power, demons into this realm may be referred to as sorcery. The matter is not straightforward as, for example, the witch or the shaman's purpose may be to heal or to harm. Essentially, religion, sorcery, shamanism and magic refer to rites of passage, ritual process or dramaturgic performances that inculcate, create and reflect embodied shifts in cognition, emotion and the senses. Transformative experience through techniques of ecstasy to summon, channel and manipulate mystical energy, whether characterised as divine or demonic, is clearly relevant in the study 
of religion and martial arts. I'm particularly interested in practices that involved a lasting change in participants, audience, through interaction with animals, <coughs> nature, dreams, and the elements. However, like war magic, the term sorcery is problematic. Caution is advised with such blunt tools. Warrior poses, for example, may reveal esoteric or occult secrets, but only misinformed people would regard their general practice as sorcery. Furthermore, assumed sorcery does a disservice to practices revered as divine or holy. Sorcery and witchcraft nevertheless provide frames for channeling spiritual knowledge and mystical experience, applying yogic techniques akin to those found in martial arts. And there is a lot of evidence for that, but I'm going to skip this to, to continue the paper. Warrior poses, yoga and martial arts. Few may claim that warrior poses in contemporary postural yoga are martial arts based. Yet in the Ungbo Heigong strengthening exercises in the seventh stage of Southern Praying Mantis Kung Fu, we find a muscular version of Vira Abadasana B, if I said that correctly. In the tenth stage training for Black Sash, there is another sequence of five stretching Heigong exercises that bear a remarkable resemblance to warrior poses in contemporary postural yoga, spe specifically uh, to Vira Badrasana A. <clears throat> so both of these poses are appearing in Southern Praying Mantis. That modernity manufactures timeless tradition is no surprise to the historian. In Yoga Body, Mark Singleton demonstrates the co-evolution of modern posture practice, what people now understand as yoga, and the rise of the European physical culture movement in the 19th century. As Singleton points out, the overlap of standing asanas and modern gymnastics is extensive enough to suggest that virtually all of them are late additions to the yoga canon through postural yoga's dialogical relationship with modern physical culture. Aside from India, the influence of physical culture movement has spread worldwide to include Hong Kong, China, Malaysia, Thailand and Singapore, the places that I've conducted research. Inside the Chingwu Athletic Association Hall in Kuala Lumpur, there was a sign over a door on the second floor that said physical culture in English. So it could seem unsurprising to discover warrior poses from Swedish and German, modern physical culture, are integrated into international postural yoga as well as into Southern Praying Mantis Kung Fu, Jingwu, and other martial arts besides. Here I want to briefly turn to the sorcerer. At the cave uh, Triasfries in France, made around 13,000 years BC. This photograph was named the Sorcerer by the Abbe Henri Brule with the assumption that in 1920, with the assumption that the pictograph fulfilled hunting magic functions. And this comes from uh, Hutton, uh, uh, who's talking about uh, Margaret Murray. I, I think what we must be accounted for is doing over being, epistemology over ontology. The meaning of the pictograph, penis and testicles swimming, uh, swinging beneath human legs, atop of which is an antlered head of a stag, remains a mystery. A clue is provided by Deleuze and Guattari that war machines always involve becoming animal. This becoming animal, becoming intense, may be triggered by dance, drugs, yoga, drumming, martial arts, fasting, fighting, and orgiastic rites. Yet the key factor to emphasize is movement. The stag is not simply an icon, pictograph, representation, or a magical talisman for the hunt, a dreamscape, or an artwork, but an example of the lived body in motion. The performance of the dancer might be regarded as a form of martiality, where the war machine derives from becoming animal. Stags, rut and fight. They contest over the possession of potential and actual mates. Hence the saucer 
is political art in the Paleolithic economy. A new interpretation of ancient cave paintings becomes possible once we shed the spectacles of religion for martiality. And of course, performance helps in this right, um, in, this, in this respect, uh, as pursued through uh, Richard Shekhar. These insights came in part from reflection on training Bagua Zhang, especially the Crescent Knives set or the Deer Antler set in Singapore in 2006 and 2007. <clears throat> Most intriguing is that warrior poses appear depicted in 40,000 year old sand rock art in the Kalahari Desert. A pectroglyph depicts a front kick, a shoulder level straight punch, and the other arm ending up in the fist guarding the crotch. And that's in the film Homo sapiens, a look into a distant mirror. I learned an identical posture during performance ethnography fieldwork with the Javanese master of Setia Hati, Izahar, True Heart Silat. And the same posture also occurs in Gongli Chun, one of the 10 basic sets of Jingwu. It may be suggested that hunters and gatherers have no need for a martial art as such because they learn the skills they need to survive and fight from hunting and fishing. Learning from childhood how to walk in stealth and how to use a spear, bow, a paddle. In this rendering, the advent of martial arts corresponds with the arrival of the state. Prior to the state, and in contradiction, in contradistinction, we have the war machine, in other words, martiality. Watching Bourdieu's excellent film, Sociology is a Martial Art, we can see that sociology wields multiple theoretical perspectives and research methods to interrogate social change, power, and inequality, and therefore provides a type of self-defense for the individual and community. Anthropology does pretty much the same thing, only it specializes in participant observation, necessitates the acquisition of a foreign language, and teaches how to navigate cultures from the ground up. While some sociologists specialize in compiling surveys from on high, anthropologists get slung into the ring. In, in that case, anthropology is less like a sport de combat, a martial art, and more like hunting, a martiality. Next, I shall dis briefly discuss the possibility of future martial arts research in Micronesia. The islands of Palau. Last year, I moved to the Republic of Palau, an archipelago situated to the north of Papua New Guinea and east of the Philippines. Micronesian martial arts are alleged to have unfortunately all but disappeared. On Palau, historic internecine village conflict, the taking of heads, and the institution of the Durango community house girl was banned a century ago by German authorities implementing a Christian missionary ethic, the spirit of capitalism. To be perfectly clear, I'm not saying that martial arts no longer exist on Palau. In fact, I am assured that certain Palauan families guard and maintain their traditional secret fighting skills passed down through the generations. There are many terms referred, referring to fighting and combat in Palauan. For example, osura, the skill of joint dislocation, similar to wrestling, and kedeset, which means to fight each other with adzes, and kawa, fighting. Therefore, the martial arts could be secret. The problem being that of gaining access. On the other hand, to the keen observer, perhaps the martial arts are hidden in plain sight in dance. War dances on, the, on Palau include Oyang, or Oyanga, training in preparation for inter-village war, and, which is now the contemporary war dance. And, O Arau, O it's hard to say this one, to perform war dance before executing an enemy. It's 
tradition. Dance served to fire up the combatants, psychologically prepare them for battle, and demonstrated martial prowess to the audience. War dances were performed in triumph to celebrate the capture of slaves, enact details of battles, and to lure enemies into traps of, of uh, buried spears. Contemporary ethnomusicology shows that dance, rook, is integral to the creation of Palawan identity. Berger Abels states, the moving body seems to be an atmospheric kaleidoscope. It is a place of great turbulence, full of unsettling movement. Matter is always in movement. Hence matter can only be followed, never defined, hence bodies are always itinerant. The dancing body, choreographing the high stories of its own ever-present now, seeks its own resonances. And here we can see the influence again of Ingo. And the notion of the body seeking its own resonances may be applied to the study of martiality. Such bodily resonances could include the knowledge of pressure points for fighting, also used in bone setting massage. Wrestling, throwing, pins and locks. But more than this, superb fitness, breath and fear control develops in sp spear fishing deep under the water, holding the breath for up to five minutes to reach depths of 100 feet. Skills also come from handling an oar and from balancing on a boat, what may be called sea legs. Recently, I watched young men repairing the thatch roof of the Bai community house at Palau Community College. They stood on the roof waiting for supplies. From 30 feet below, short double-ended spears were thrown upwards to, to them, which they caught while walking along the apex of a roof. Such feats require great poise, dexterity and courage. Palawan children climb all day long in dense thickets of mangrove forests that surround parts of the island. In the past, these provided village fortifications from attack by the sea, from the sea. Another example is a Palawan father training his son to kill and butcher a pig along the joints, also slicing up marlin and shark for village feasts. Therefore, we must look for clues to martialities in the environment and in the resonances of the body and movement. <coughs> Artworks appear everywhere on Palau, from ancient rock petroglyphs to etchings on the bai, in Japanese introduced carved storyboards, and fine art paintings of themes from the mythic past. Yet there is no word for art in Palau. What are we to make of art when there is no word for art? And what does that mean for martial arts that are supposedly extinct? I think the problem is of misplaced concreteness. Art itself is a product of Western modernity from the 14th century onwards. The Dada movement sought to abolish art, but there is no need to abolish art on Palau. Of course, this begs the question of the abolition of martial arts in favour of martialities. Conclusion. In this paper, I suggest that the enthusiastic embrace of martial arts studies should not blind us to the advantages provided by a reformulation towards martialities. I build a case for an ideational shift towards martiality providing examples from academic reflection, personal experience, and current ethnographic research design on Palau. Martial arts are themselves a moving target, and the ossification, institutionalization, and organization of any particular style is predominantly an aspect of the museification of culture. Applying the Dada movement's call for the abolition of art, it may be suggested that we should abolish martial arts as our frame of reference. To understand how martialities have become ossified into martial arts may reveal how spiritual experience 
is turned to stone in organised religion. Reframing martial arts as martiality facilitates a direct connection, if not a merger, between the formerly discrete areas of war magic and martial arts as embodied knowledge. Above, I noted that performance hovers between practice and representation in martial arts studies in the reader. I have also shown how the same warrior poses that operate in international postural yoga are found in Southern Praying Mantis, Kung Fu. Rather than agree these postures are derived from European physical culture, I question if they may have an origin that can be traced back to performance in the Paleolithic. Uh, this following Shekna and adopting a, a deep time performative perspective has therefore facilitated a view of martial skills as martiality. Even where specific martial skills are not demonstrated, represented or practised, bodily resonances may still be detected in performance. Dance, hunting and deep sea spearfishing. These resonances of the body might otherwise be called the spirit of a culture and persist even in places where the indigenous culture and religion have been displaced by colonialism. Resonances of martialities have an ancient pedigree stretching back to Paleolithic rock art. There is an urgent need, finally, for further research into martiality because under current conditions toxic variants need to be dismantled. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.